these days uh, new knowledge is produced using either science or technology or a combination of this is a hybrid uh, version of science tech uh, uh, fields and they generate uh, marketable knowledge So you have been uh, very illustrious. It's so unfortunate that in uh, terms of intellectual awareness, academic awareness, there is a big divide between South of India and North of India, as I see. A lot of scholars from South of India are not known to scholars in uh, metropolitan centers, metropolitan institutions. I see a very strange kind of intellectual politics, academic politics, which keeps us in different parts of India and we don't get to know one another. Even yeah. this kind of contact, we have to be thankful to Corona <laughs> virus. <laughs> very uh, uh, contradictory <laughs> kind of thing. But, uh, but uh, I have a lot of friends in Northern India. I took my PhD from JNU and so I was very much there. Uh, and also I taught in JNU for some, for some time. Yes, yes. Yeah. But you have been uh, exceptionally thinking about uh, the question of pedagogy, pedagogy, the question of yes, higher yes. education, ah. the the whole idea about what knowledge could be, not only in this troubled time, also before that. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Right. Which means it takes us back to your very crucial work on knowledge production, which was in a historical framework. Hmm. Need to say, but that also gives us a ground to think of a future in terms of you know what knowledge production would look like in future. Yes, you are very right. Now, until you raised that question, I was in thinking like that. You know uh, whether uh, we would be in a position to uh, project to the future in terms of the nature of knowledge, structure of knowledge, and 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 so on. But uh, in connection with the COVID nineteen education. I uh, just tried to speculate a bit there. No, so if one has to speculate further, now I, mm -hmm. I the reason why I mentioned your uh, very prompt uh, reflections, various kind of ruminations, because I've been following this journal that you edit. So what is that idea of knowledge production, which occupied your mind for long time? You know, we, we always find all kinds of knowledge uh, forms. Uh, coexisting and sometimes interacting and sometimes without any interaction amongst um, one another. But uh, you you find uh, every epoch uh, having one dominant kind of knowledge uh, uh, and all other forms are structured by th this dominance. And, uh, and and on one side, you find uh, all other forms of knowledge relegated to background as uh, ontological representations, and the dominant uh, no dominant knowledge alone as the epistemologically valid, uh, and and it in fact commands the epistemological meanings, measures, and and parameters, so that uh, other forms of knowledge can be easily marginalized, just by pointing out the epistemological criteria and also the methodological uh, strategies to ensure reliability of knowledge. You, know, you can ask any knowledge item in terms of uh, its reliability. That kind of methodological strategies uh, are not available in various types of knowledge, particularly the one which is wholly dependent on what is called tacit knowledge. And, and tacit knowledge is actually a very creative kind of knowledge and, and it's not self-conscious kind of knowledge. Uh, so that is in the background of your explorations. And what kind of materials did you deal with when you had to talk about uh, 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 knowledge production and knowledge economy? What kind of historical materials, basically? Uh, in, in knowledge economy, I discussed with the help of political economy of uh, 
uh, our times. Uh, basically, critical political economy of technology, critical political economy of science. And then, uh, you know, you know uh, these days, uh, new knowledge is produced using either science or technology or a combination of this. This is a hybrid uh, version of science tech uh, uh, fields. And they generate uh, marketable knowledge. Uh, and it is possible today that uh, you can transact knowledge at Im uh, unimaginably huge uh, price. Uh, for example, a, a small software, it could be. But what would be the exchange value uh, is not able to be imagined by the author of that knowledge itself. We just take the instance of uh, Zuckerberg's transaction uh, with the WhatsApp group. You know, he purchased WhatsApp for $19 billion, which WhatsApp group uh, never thought. I mean, WhatsApp uh, uh, architects never thought as the possible market price of it. And so he was ready to offer uh, $16 billion US dollars in cash and the rest as share of his Facebook uh, establishment. So, and also he was able to anticipate the scope of WhatsApp at the very inception itself. He knew that uh, WhatsApp would take over Facebook. So Zuckerberg uh, immediately transacted. So that kind of transactions are going on at various levels of uh, science tech hybrid fields of uh, research and, and the corporates are heavily investing in in that in in that sector so even in historical context when you talk about the dominance of one kind of knowledge one kind of epistemology is that dominance because of certain kind of knowledge economy that supports the dominant position yes yes very much true because in when we say knowledge economy uh, uh, see, first, let me make it very clear that you know, knowledge economy is not what most of us think. Uh, it, it has to be understood as the economy that depends upon the production, consumption, and exchange of knowledge. Uh, policymakers celebrate uh, uh, the, the transformation uh, of the nation into knowledge society as something like. Uh, the ultimate goal uh, or the very ideal kind of state. Uh, for example, the National Education Policy 2019 postulated uh, equitable and sustainable transformation of the nation into a knowledge society. Um, actually, making of the knowledge society means augmenting the knowledge consuming society. There is, there is no guarantee that knowledge society will be dominating in the art and science of production of knowledge. The knowledge economy is the, the, is, uh, the most important thing to be focused and, and what would be the, the future of nation in, in, in that kind of an economy. Now, we don't find uh, India capable of commanding intellectual property and patents of uh, that kind constituting what is called pu public resource. We have, have a very good patent act and all that but uh, it's not that easy for uh, nationalizing intellectual property, nationalizing patents and, and so on. Uh, when you think about them in the context of the international laws relating to it. So the, the whole thing uh, about, uh, about knowledge economy has to be understood uh, uh, as part of global capitalism. It's, it's in fact the latest version of capitalism and uh, knowledge economy is the popular expression of that. Academically, uh, the latest version of uh, capitalism is called techno-capitalism. Yeah, where do you see the origin? When does it start really? Uh, it, it's, yes, uh, it started uh, among academics themselves and academics started uh, insisting upon uh, patents and intellectual property and so on. Uh, but intellectual property rights 
uh, was something um, very formal, uh, formally articulated thing in the 19th century, but it became an obsession uh, soon. Now we find uh, uh, intellectual property rights and patents uh, constituting what is called intangible assets for capitalism because its transactional value is, as I said earlier, unimaginable. And there is uh, a, a process called commodity fetishism. As we talk about uh, commodity uh, uh, fetishism in the industrial context, but here the commodity is knowledge itself. Knowledge is not only commodity, it's also capital. So capital fetishism is another phase. So knowledge is uh, separated from its author. And then uh, there is trade around it. But in the beginning, uh, economy was not very much interested in monopolizing control over knowledge. Because knowledge was only part of its forces of production if you, if you follow uh, critical political economy. Uh, but now that is not the situation. In the knowledge was only uh, supportive of profitable commodity production. Knowledge itself was not uh, the commodity. But soon, uh, capitalism, particularly after 2008 recession, realized that the most promising field uh, of, of our better accumulation of capital is knowledge itself. So control knowledge domain and then uh, encourage production of marketable knowledge and, and then uh, establish industry around that. So now you have uh, corporates uh, uh, having globally built up huge research establishments yeah. for generating marketable knowledge and, and, and all in science. And, and uh, all the and university research. scholars all the university scholars seem to be at the mercy of the corporate uh, uh, Exactly, yes, yes, very much. Earlier on, see, an academic uh, like you and I may be able to uh, decide what is new in our field. We are doing research in our area. And in our area of specialization, we decide which is the latest. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, but now uh, corporates decide which is the cutting edge research area and and what kind of research should be carried forward and and look at these science tech hybrid fields uh, like genomics agrobiotechnology bioinformatics biosynthetic engineering nanotechnology graphene engineering robotics uh, and you know, all all kinds of uh, areas uh, earlier molecular physicists or molecular chemists or uh, molecular biologists never thought of the area called synthetic bioengineering or molecular bioengineering it's all engineering at the right. at the, at the micro level no yeah. that also uh, reminds me a few years ago uh, i just realized that you know the very idea of research has not been huh. sufficiently debated in the university setup, nobody really questions the idea of research. We just yeah. take it for granted that, you know, this is research, this is how research is to be done. Yeah. I suppose the corporate interventions uh -huh. has been at that core level where they have started telling yeah. us as to yeah. what research means. Yes, yes. And, and corporate started deciding whether the knowledge that you generate through research is of any value to the contemporary uh, society. When they say contemporary society, they mean the contemporary market. <laughs> so academics, uh, academics has this big constraint of engaging themselves in the production of marketable knowledge. It's, it's not knowledge of their interest or academics have freedom to generate knowledge which is not of any immediate use. And, and most aspects of science uh, if you take science as a very broad field, uh, emerged like that. It was not just in response to the, the contemporary demand for it. Of course, there was 
necessity, but uh, uh, of course we have the question, whose necessity are you talking about? Necessity generally uh, is translated as necessity of people, but there isn't anything like that. Always there has been the class uh, uh, dominance about it and powerful people uh, in, in the society decided what should be uh, the necessity of the time and what uh, actually needs to be done. Uh, but now it has become very, very clear because there is a direct influence, not just influence, a direct command of the corporate economy over the academic domain. And, and um, it's not altogether accidental that the new education policy uh, was drafted by the corporates themselves. It's, it's mainly because knowledge economy is uh, their central interest. Uh, because, you know, you don't find any other field so rich and potential in facilitating capital accumulation. I uh, fully appreciate uh, the sophisticated uh, Marxist understanding of the political economy behind knowledge production. Uh, yeah. and the role of corporate bodies. Uh, there is no disagreement, no denial about that. I fully uh, appreciate this idea. However, I take you back to the basic uh, uh, notion of the predominant epistemology, right? And yeah. uh, I will also take you back in time, in history, because I know you were a student of Professor Romila Thapar at one point of time in JNU. Yes. Uh, so I'm sure that uh, predilection for going back in time must be uh, a hobby horse like of any historian. So I take you back in time and I recall uh, uh, A.L. Basham giving us through his PhD research, uh, A.L. Basham giving yeah. us a story of Ajivikas. Now mm -hmm. Ajivikas disappeared from Patliputra. A very small number yeah. was found, a small chunk was found in somewhere in the south of India. But uh, disappearance of Ajika, Aj, Ajivikas was mm. also an example of predominant epistemology of that time. And that time it was not Vedic Aryanism, it was instead uh, Buddhism and Jainism. Yes. So, with the rise of Buddhism and Jainism, a, a, a faith like Ajivikas disappeared, which became relegated. It may not yeah. have disappeared, disappeared entirely. It may have become tacit part of social knowledge. Yes. Yeah. So there, in that kind of scenario, we don't see any corporate body. And yet we see the play of uh, dominant epistemology. What is uh, uh, You know, uh, I think on one side, which ontology is able to attract the largest number of people, uh, I, I think was the question. If you take the uh, Vedic period, for example, and then we'll come to the Ajivikas and Buddhism, Jainism, and so on. Uh, the, um, the Vedic people, uh, the Vedic Mimamsa uh, uh, itself got uh, you know, divided into two groups, one purely ritualistic and the other group thinking about the metaphysics of rituals. But at, and at, at that stage, the, uh, the Mimamsakas dominated and, and they in fact controlled the rituals and, and so on. They always had an upper hand uh, in all the sacrifices, you know, Vedic rituals and so on, as the uh, people who held the metaphysics uh, behind or people who knew the metaphysics behind. But soon you find a, a, a transcendental phase uh, in, during the Upanishadic times that they, they were not interested in rituals at all. They were talking about uh, purely rational things and they, they were on the verge of atheism, although they did not openly articulate it. The Advaita Vedanta at that level was actually atheism. And it's an offshoot of that you find in Ajivika, uh, in the Jain, the Buddhist, uh, and, and various uh, such uh, worldviews. And, and then uh, the Mimamsakas suffered a setback and for 
quite some time the Jain uh, Buddhist Ajivika uh, knowledge forms uh, really exerted uh, some kind of control over the ruling uh, ruling lineages, princes from the royal families and and so on. And 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 uh, look at the kind of uh, epistemological epistemologically valid uh, uh, kind of text knowledge text produced during the period by by the second century ad third century ad the intellectuals of the time thought about advaita uh, thoughts and then they developed the the nyaya philosophy and you think about the various uh, systems of thoughts six systems of uh, philosophy or thoughts called shaddarshanas so the nyaya vaisheshika sankhya uh, and and uh, uh, you know the, the most important of all the vedanta and that led to a clear uh, a methodology of the production of knowledge but we we missed our actual bus or we missed the train the major population went with the mimamsagas and ritualists and so on who converged uh, in the bhagavata movement the bhakti kind of and they concocted the very notion of advaita of the upanishads into the oneness of god there is no god as such in 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 the Upanishadic thinking, uh, there the Brahma is not the Brahma which is discussed uh, as part of the trio uh, Shiva, Vish- Vishnu, and Brahma. No, yes. Brahma is used as a, new, a neutral gender. Brahma is a power field. It's universal consciousness. Yes. And then there, their discussion was about the individual consciousness having communication with uh, the uh, the universal consciousness brahma so atman brahman uh, that that kind of uh, inseparable uh, uh, you know homologous connection all these were uh, the problems debated by a group but suddenly you find the bhagavata movement coming up and then oh the celebration of the whole thing, the Heliodorus pillar, uh, and it also acquiring a larger geographical uh, area. And the whole people boarded that train. Still, we have this problem. Where, where, where is that rational uh, ontology lost? Or where, where is uh, that rational thinking lost in all sorts of bizarre uh, notions and, and thinking, still the country is not able to get out of it. Right. No, but was it really lost entirely? Because uh, the tacit presence of even Lokayata huh. uh, or, or Tantra, for example, Tantra, Lokayata, or these kind of heterodoxy, huh. or even Buddhism later on, they did not, did they entirely disappear from the everyday life? From the ontological landscape of people, that's the yeah. They did not uh, disappear, but they got radically and fundamentally transformed into uh, something else. True, true. Yeah, it, that is it. See, it, uh, it all got mixed up with the pantheistic magic, and and uh, the tantric thing um, got um, completely disfigured. And and on the other side, mixture of the Upanishadic thinking, mixing up of the Upanishadic thinking with the uh, the the uh, what is called the tantric uh, kind of thinking. So you have the yogic uh, uh, yogic tradition on the one side, and and then the uh, the Patanjali uh, you know uh, version of the yoga of the Upanishadic. Uh, uh, people. So now you have a mixture of both. See, ac- actually, yoga uh, in Brahmatnyana 
is totally different from hatha yoga right what, uh, what you see today is a billionaire uh, enterprise uh-huh. developed later uh, by the um, brands uh, uh, yes it actually began in karnataka mixing up acrobatics of the dutch people with the hatha yoga practices and ayangara hi ayangara yoga and uh, it, it was uh, uh, i mean it really originated in the palace uh, of um what they are professor gurukul this is very uh, uh, interesting to see i mean there was a generation of marxist scholars who were very well versed in all kind of traditional literature scriptures variety of sources we we can name quite a few of them yeah. and that that breed is fast disappearing you seem to be one of those last in that breed yeah who is who is uh, interested in uh, employing marxist apparatus to see the world as it is and on the other hand you are also willing to make references to various kind of local vernacular sources of wisdom how does that happen i, I think it, it happened in the process of economic development you know originally we know that the workers were inventors of new technology new practices because they wanted to reduce the the hard labor so it was uh, the workers who invented the pulley system or uh, before that the inclined plane it, mainly to reduce the see the hard labor or uh, uh, reduce the uh, uh, hard labor in uh, from their part but uh, soon what you find is uh, there is some kind of codification of the tacit knowledge embedded in the practices of the working people uh, the hard laborers and uh, that practice continued now look at the uh, craftsmen group uh, the artisans and craftsmen engaged in specialized arts and crafts like metallurgy uh, and and uh, mm, uh, construction uh, in, in various uh, art uh, various handicrafts production there you don't find any codified text and the best example of codification by a group of people who never had any hands on um, experience is uh, what is called uh, vastu shastra today a indian architecture actually there is no point in uh, thinking about these things with a nation centric perception right. there is Uh, even in the case of indian philosophy or indian mathematics and so on there is no point in saying like that indian math, there is uh, naturally the question what is indian in indian mathematics or if you say and hey, then you finally find mathematics as the main knowledge field and then at one point of time there is contribution by uh, uh, people who lived in the indian subcontinent at various parts to so indian uh a mathematics uh in that sense is a is a wrong usage or uh kerala school of mathematics if you if you trace the history of calculus for example you reach the text produced by madhava nilakanta and so on who lived during medieval kerala 14th 15th centuries hmm. it is calculus for the first time a textbook in calculus is written in malayalam prose and therefore uh, and in some the 8th 8th century uh, no no for 14th century oh, 14th. 14th. Huh. the whole calculus uh, depended on what is called infinite series see the uh, the power series or the sine cosine series with uh, the trigonometric functions so the first uh, instance known instance is in the text by madhava of sangam grama uh, namely venuaroha that's where you find the series for the first time but until uh, recently uh, see for example until 3 years ago when uh, in one of the international conference of the mathematicians 
uh, George Givergis Joseph, uh, who uh, is professor of, I mean, who used to be professor of uh, econometrics in uh, uh, Manchester University. He's mm. uh, professor emeritus there. He was the one, uh, he was the first to raise this question. Because in Encyclopedia, we all used to see uh, the author of Infinite Series as Leibniz. And they are called. They were called Leibniz series. It's after the this particular uh, historic world uh, congress of mathematicians where uh, George Givergis moved a resolution, and the resolution was accepted. Ever since, in the encyclopedia, you find Madhava Leibniz series. It's not just a Leibniz series. Hmm. It's Madhava Leibniz series. There are there are series, uh, other series as well. Uh, Leibniz contemporary Newton had developed his own series, and there existed Gregory series. Uh, but power series uh, uh, being the only alternative to have mathematical measurement about uh, uh, uns, uh, say unknown velocity and position. If you are forced to make an assessment of position and velocity of objects the shape of which you do not know, the position of which you do not know, the velocity of which uh, you do not know if it is in motion. And, and then there is a mathematical strategy to make the assessment. And, and, and that was rendered plausible by the power series. Hmm. And power series began in, in uh, Kerala. But that is not enough just to talk about the Kerala School of Mathematics, which the mathematicians in Kerala celebrate these days. There isn't anything called the Kerala School of Calculus or Kerala School of Mathematics. It's in that context, you know, we were, I mean, we just deviated to this. So uh, take architecture. What is Indian in Indian uh, Vastu? It's just superstition and uh, caste prejudices, nothing else. Right. So what if you ask the question, what is Indian in Indian architecture, uh, superstition and uh, caste pre practices? There is no architecture about talking. Shudra should construct their huts in, in any place they, uh, they, they are allowed. And the Brahmins should have the ideal terrain, which should be um, very uh, stable and also should be an elevated place with the availability of water all along and from where one would be able to see the rise of Saptarshis, the, the seven stars. See, this is not architecture. So we certainly had wonderful uh, architectural wisdom, no doubt about it, but that should be called Vastu Vidya, not Vastu Shastra. What to Shastra, Vastu Shastra is purely superstitious and caste prejudice oriented stuff. And, and then oh, we have monumental uh, evidences, standing monuments, Ajanda, Ellora, Abaja, Karla, Anderi, Kanheri. Uh, and, and uh, you know, in various places, you have excellent uh, uh, facsimile of construction engineering. But they were all uh, articulated by the craftsmen. Craftsmen had what you have been referring to, the, uh, the uh, tacit knowledge. And that tacit knowledge is embedded in their uh, monumental constructions. But you have all kinds of texts like uh, uh, Shilparetna, Mayamada, um, then uh, uh, various texts all over uh, the, uh, all over the subcontinent, but you don't find this the so-called tacit knowledge embedded in any of the texts. True. Uh, only works. Only craftsmen knew it. Hmm. But craftsmen could be uh, dominated and managed as uh, shudra karmakara or uh, uh, enslaved craftsmen by showing the authority on the works that they did um, in the form of codified codified texts. Yeah. So from there, I wanted to uh, once again uh, emphasize on uh, 
the fact that uh, left liberal academia or left liberal intelligentsia seem to have lost contact with the variety of craftsmen. Uh, if I have to put it in example, one can say probably all those who are technocratic managerial administrators of universities, they are hardly in contact with the craftsmen of the university called the teachers. Exactly. Yes, it's very much true. Take our engineering colleges, even IITs. Uh, actually, an engineering college is supposed to be producing engineers. But out of lakhs and lakhs of engineering graduates, you find very few engineers, very few engineers. Uh, engineering graduates are being produced. They get proliferated, but very few engineers. A, a engineering should enable a person to uh, be uh, competent in producing uh, engine, say, as a, as a symbolic kind of thing. So engineering should end up with a product. Similarly, uh, technology should end up with a process. So you can talk about computer technology because it's an operating system oriented uh, 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 science and science, computer science uh, would enable a person to generate softwares. Similarly, a hardware computer engineer uh, should be able to assemble a computer. So, the, so I, I, I always um, try to distinguish technology from engineering in, in this sense. Engineering ends up with a product and technology ends up with a process. But you find graduates and graduates in both the areas not ending up anywhere. So you have... Come. And even in social sciences, uh, not only in uh, science, technology, engineering, also in social science education in universities and colleges. Yes, yes. Very much true. There is a kind of alienation in uh, learning social affairs, uh, human affairs. Um, it's just uh, uh, studying an area uh, for the sake of examination. There is no uh, uh, what is called uh, curiosity driven uh, relationship with the knowledge objects. Nobody is studying social sciences. True. I would say most mostly uh, people are not uh, studying social sciences with a, a, a real um, commitment to cognitive encounter with uh, reality. They, they don't understand things in relation to what is going on around it's, them. It's also because as teachers in universities and colleges, yeah. we have become more like uh, management staff or, uh, or service providers. I, I mean, I remember you talking about maverick professors yeah. in one of your editorial in the journal. And yeah, it was delightful to read that, you know, somebody is talking about the necessity of giving space to maverick professors. Yes. Our universities are no longer that kind of space where a professor could be maverick. Sure, sure. Yeah, you're very true. Uh, see, actually, uh, see, we have to start with uh, the question, what is uh, uh, the nature of or what are the attributes of an eminent uh, university? A eminent, uh, an eminent university uh, should have certain uh, uh, attributes. Now, we are not inventing them. That's what very eminent, uh, globally well-entrenched universities have shown us. The first one is a, long, a fairly long intellectual heritage. Institutions should have that. And then critical mass consisting of a sizable number of students and teachers. Then uh, diversity and a very rich library besides a sprawling campus with the most vibrant space of learners. Actually, this is the space of Mavericks that we are talking about. Automatically, in that kind of an environment, uh, teachers would become 
Mavericks. But barring a few, our universities and colleges are not accomplished institutions. And the so-called few have become rigid, as you said earlier, bureaucratic and uh, undemocratic institutions. Under such circumstances, teachers also become rigid, bureaucratic and authoritarian. Following a kind of militaristic discipline and uh, teaching uh, stereotypical lessons, they, they, they I mean, teachers uh, degenerate. They themselves degenerate academically. Right. Therefore, uh, so uh, the most important thing is uh, we have to turn the universities and colleges to decentralized, de-bureaucratized, uh, democratized, and flexible institutions first. Then the teachers will acquire good knowledge base, start teaching how to learn instead of uh, delivering stereotypical lessons and they automatically become mavericks. I, I, I know that you were in, uh, you were instrumental in uh, establishing uh, Mahatma Gandhi University. Uh, so do you see Mahatma Gandhi University, which is fairly new, uh, uh, do you see it following some of these kind of you know ideas to allow maverick minds to flourish? Yeah, yes, yes, very, very much. Actually, these were not founded by me. I was only continuing uh, the practices of a Maverick Vice Chancellor, you are Anantamurti. Yes, yes. Yeah, he, uh, he turned the university uh, into what is called a, a very eminent institution. And he set certain uh, practices, certain uh, good conventions. And uh, he tried his best to make uh, each department uh, highly demanding, uh, uh, a highly demanding one at the entrance examination and uh, after the admission in the classes, in the exam and so on. And, and he used to be telling us that uh, a, a university becomes important when university has certain compulsions on the teachers and students. See, you take, uh, he used to say that you take any uh, ordinary students of ours after graduating with us would join Princeton University or Cambridge by chance. And then after three, four years, they come and meet you as Princeton products or Cambridge products or Oxford University products. The reason right. is, you know, I personally experienced it because uh, I'm, uh, I must say I'm extremely grateful to my teachers in the school and colleges who inspired me and shaped my thoughts. But even after graduating as the university topper in, in, in history, I had no clarity about my aptitude until I became a student of JNU. So looking back, I realized that I came out from JNU as a JNU product. I, I'm proud of it. JNU campus, the CHS, its faculty, especially luminaries like Romila Thapar, Sarvapalli Gopal, and Bipin Chandra. And, uh, you know, they literally woke me up. So this was in 1977 or 78? Uh, 72. I joined, no, 73. Ah. I, I joined uh, JNU in 73. So that was at the time when JNU was a way of life. It's still JNU is JNU uh, in, in its own right. But there is a lot of difference. And then you know better, you know, what happened to JNU and so on. But uh, uh, there wasn't any other experience, any institutional experience uh, to cite. So uh, despite uh, good institutions, very good teachers and so on, uh, an average student like me became self-consciously a realist in my learning. I could understand that history is... Uh, I could understand that history was my field and I was able to do research without any sense of alienation because that was the way uh, Professor Champak Lakshmi or Romala Thapar used to teach. So I, I remember Romala's lectures. You know, Romala would uh, pull out the chair and will sit among us and then would, uh, in a very effortless way, talk about the way she was able to generate new knowledge uh, of, uh, about the Mauryas in Mauryan history. You're talking about the, the spate of publications uh, of the earlier period and then how Ashoka um, 
um, was a focus uh, of several historians and in what way she was able to uh, uh, deviate from the earlier studies and then she would also suggest at the end that these these areas are still gray areas some of you can focus on them and so on so this was uh, an altogether different kind of learning experience as far as i was concerned uh, uh, and 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 then uh, you know uh, exposing a field of knowledge and then uh, uh, making students acquainted with the process of production of knowledge and a, a teacher autobiographically talking about her own relationship of cognitive encounter with a gray area and the way she was able to make new discoveries she was able to make new interpretations and so on so that that method was something quite revealing and uh, I started experiencing the centrality of the discipline in that sense. Not uh, in in the earlier classes I attended of very eminent teachers who used to lecture using uh, uh, high-sounding expressions and so on. History used to be uh, a delivery of thick literature, and the, the teacher walking up and down in the class see discussing uh, ashoka's kalinga battle as if he himself was a participant in that and then <laughs> keeping up keeping all of us as the vanquished kalinga people at the <laughs> end of the class <laughs> so and but that was really a, a, an experience and then um i was comparing uh, you know the two and then the the, the contrast and how this contrast was helpful for a student to uh, actually understand things in real terms and then uh, providing competency to a, a researcher to situate her study, uh, his study in the context of a, a real uh, inquiry. I mean, without any alienation between the topic of study and and then the learner so what is i mean you have seen a large span of uh, uh, experiences of higher education starting from early 70s jnu education to working with u r anand murthy at uh, mahatma gandhi university even now you are very active educationist so yeah. what kind of future of higher education should we imagine after yeah. pandemic uh, yes so we we should discuss what happened to be uh, the nature of education during the pandemic period you know higher education in the in the conventional sense as a teacher centric uh, curriculum based activity uh, really suffered during the pandemic it is undergoing the same kind of uh difficulties but uh higher education as curiosity driven self directed and intimately personal kind of enterprise i would say it has not uh, it has not been suffering during the uh the uh, pandemic because uh although it is a small percentage youngsters are they uh, are very much uh, interested in autonomous learning and 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 they uh, they they really enjoy the benefit of autonomy in learning they are uh, in need of flexibility and choice but uh, this is not available in the in the actual institutional setting we already discussed that that during the pandemic higher education i mean during the pandemic uh, uh, a period higher education uh, has been dull for teachers because most of them have been mulling things over how to use online uh, many uh, many still think that podcasts of their classroom lecture 
serve the purpose. But online teaching is not just the online delivery of the audio visual exactly. uh, audio version of lectures through True. Skype or a platform. And then in fact, very few teachers uh, took it as a struggle to push their online teaching closer to the actual by using smart classrooms and multimedia lesson products and so on. And some of them have been regularly using the email, Facebook, WhatsApp, and Skype for interacting with their students and clearing their doubts. But um, a large majority of teachers, they just you know, they just delivered a, 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 a podcast and then uh, got done with it. Uh, so they got a, a lot of leisure. Comparatively, students have been smart and successful in, in, in using digital platforms and uh, I must say web-based sources of learning. Uh, and they, they are continuing, uh, continuing that. But the pity is that you have a very few uh, of them or a very small percentage of them. So what is the way out? I think uh, pandemic will continue for another year at least. And then there will be a natural phasing out. Therefore, uh, uh, it is high time for uh, our uh, education policy makers have realized that uh, online teaching has to be really made uh, sophisticated enough to go somewhere near actual teaching. In fact, technopedagogy is a, 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 I wrote about it in one of my uh, editorials, right. uh, is, a, is very rich, very rich and enterprising and has been flourishing ever since the outbreak of COVID-19. But most of our teachers refuse to use the technology. Yeah. <laughs> they forget that, you know, um, uh, always there have been tools along with the teaching. Blackboard is the best example. But recently, I do not know why, uh, teachers started abstaining from using Blackboard, particularly in liberal arts, humanities and social sciences. The use of Blackboard is minimal uh, these days. And I know some of the history teachers uh, showing courage to teach geographical discoveries without a world map. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that. So with the pandemic, edu, edu tech tools or uh, what is called techno-pedagogy uh, tools have made a sudden and forceful entry to higher education institutions. And, and they are going to remain. That's what we should be uh, careful about. They are going to remain uh, even after the pandemic. Mm. The teachers will have to accept them as the inevitable complementary of classroom teaching. Mm. I am reminded of Elizabeth Kubler-Rose model mm. uh, in the context of our uh, teacher's attitude towards technopedagogy. Yeah. Uh, the Kubler-Rose model uh, I hope you are familiar. Model shows that when something is introduced first, immediate response would be a denial of it. Right. But they deny it. And then they grow angry and <laughs> try to bargain and get depressed. And finally, they accept. So this is the Dabra model of uh, Elizabeth Kobler Rose. Same is the case with our teachers. Um, see, when I think about their attitude towards techno-pedagogy, they deny its benefits and then they grow angry also. They try to bargain, bargain. <laughs> and I, as uh, the, uh, the vice chairman of higher education council, I had to respond to their bargaining. They wanted training. So we provided the hands-on training to um, something like some 300, 400 teachers in the, in the colleges. Uh, but you know, the pity is that they resist and then uh, finally they accept. But the acceptance is at the de depressed movement and the depressed moment. Yeah. So there is no point in uh, gaining acceptance by a depressed group. By the time they are totally 
uh, bereft of their creative ability. That's a major problem. And it's here, uh, as you uh, rightly pointed out earlier, the role of mavericks uh, is important. Sure. We need mavericks among teachers for the creative utilization of technopedagogy. I totally agree with you. Uh, only yeah. thing is that, you know, at school level, teachers may still have a willingness to go yeah. to a procedure. But at higher education level, I find that many teachers don't recognize that they are teachers to begin with. They yeah. are always on such ivory tower that ah. as uh, proper academic Brahmins, they look down upon anybody who considers himself or herself an ordinary teacher. <laughs> very, very, very true. Yes, yes. And they are not actually uh, supposed to be teachers uh, uh, of fixed lessons. They are uh, they are they are they have to be maverick professors uh, teaching how to learn exactly they are uh, so they are not expected to finish one topic or the other which is outlined in the uh, syllabus mm -hmm. maverick professors go out of the syllabus because they see in front of them students thorough with the basics they they don't waste their time teaching basics again and again but what we see in the ordinary colleges today is that the students learn basics uh, at the undergraduate level, the basics which they had already learned at the plus two level. And then even at the PG level, a substantial portion of the teaching uh, is spent for refreshing their basics. With the result, they are a long way off from the latest developments in the, in the knowledge field. Up. At pedagogic level, a pandemic situation demands from pedagogues, teachers, to yes. uh, to help students connect their troubled experiences with some of the basic learning, uh, and that you yes. know that whole process of connecting experience, uh, connecting ontology with epistemology, so to say, is, yes. well, is a yes. challenge for us that we need to accept. Uh, happily, creatively. Yes, yes. So it is. Uh, it's a ponderous paradox to see that the uh, students doing research in virology uh, are not really opening their eyes. The reason is, see that their uh, their professors are also not. Uh, their professors are also like that. But to take, I haven't studied thoroughly. But mm -hmm. I can confidently guess that we don't have any uh, publication in Corona uh, Virology uh, from India. None of the uh, professors in the medical colleges, no, why colleges, All India Institute of Medical Science you take, I don't think uh, that any virologist there or for that matter, uh, a, a professor of medicine there, capable of drawing worldwide attraction or uh, worldwide attention to a publication by them, a, a discovery by them, or an invention by them. It's not. You don't find so many professors in medical institutions in India publishing in high impact factor journals. You just try to search some of the very well-known professors. I must say with a lot of gratitude that we have excellent practitioners. Excellent practitioners. There is no doubt about it. And they are world-class practitioners. World-class surgeons and world-class physicians, no doubt about it. But we should also take into account the fact that the best students, cream of the society, uh, you know, the best students are joining the medical institutions and then they come out as excellent practitioners, fine. But is that all right? What is their intellectual property contribution? If you ask, one will have to uh, say that it is zero. So that is a, that's a major problem. So this happens because of this, that even when you have a, a, an extremely challenging kind of issue around, 
in the academic business you are not able to establish a relationship of encounter with the threatening object out with your academic inquiry so there is this hiatus and also alienation uh, quite strong here it's not the problem of the people involved in teaching or people involved in learning because we find the same teachers going out becoming uh, extremely productive because as i said earlier the institution there is a demanding one where doctor becomes a, a scientist as well the students in medical science become uh, genuine investigators but here they acquire skill in treatment and they are meant for that it's a, it's a an institutional problem uh, otherwise we wouldn't be finding uh, these many indians now working in well known uh, institutions the medical college of the um, uh, hopkins university or for that matter any university abroad any well known university abroad has indians indian scientists in various fields of medicine so to draw closure to this conversation i thought i should ask you in last 5 7 years a uh, whole of india has uh, become familiar with uh, kerala model of development kerala model of governance kerala model of health and hygiene system yes likewise do you think uh, we are going to start admiring kerala model of higher education too sooner or later ha, yes all other aspects fine kerala has been excelling in various fields and the uh, development indices show that uh, kerala was on a par with the developed countries uh, a, a, a totally different kind of geographical locale in in india with uh, uh, intellectual and um, uh, administrative culture so we have a highly decentralized a uh, kind of system where very well empowered uh, self governing institutions so the self governing institutions and in at the panchayat at the village level uh, are really uh, uh, economically also competent to take up local issues so we have been uh, using the 1972 constitutional amendment of the panchayati raj nagarpalika bill uh, that amendment uh, as a people's campaign here people's campaign uh, was meant to empower people as a local planners at the village level people were to understand the local resources and uh, it was also an ecologically sustainable kind of a notion of development introduced at that stage so the resilience of the local uh, ecosystem with the people uh, that was focused and that tradition continued and you have something like 35% of the total budget directly released to the uh, the panchayats the, the local level self governing bodies and we have a large number of uh, hospitals even there are good facility hospitals in the villages and panchayats and so on and of course at the background we have high literacy 100% literacy and generally people are enlightened although you have obscurantist uh, Uh, a kind of approach also uh, finding place but when there is a crisis i do not know how it is uh, appearing suddenly there is manifestation of rational community a, a, a group of people thinking beyond caste creed religious difference and and what not so that uh, kind of setup has enabled the the people uh, to have a government like this and then certainly one has to uh, talk about the uh, leadership quality of the government 
that that is the reason why the same government is voted back uh, to power uh, right. and the chief minister is uh, a, uh, a world uh, renowned administrator now and then our uh, health minister uh, mrs k k shailaja and she is also known all over the world so the way they were able to uh, acquire thoroughness about the affairs first and then uh, clarity about the steps to be taken and then in a 100% democratic way the chief minister communicating the steps to be taken by the exactly. uh, uh, yeah so th- they are used to have evening uh, a channel uh, based presentation of the steps of government the state of affairs the actual situation and so on uh, and then it used to be a regular kind of uh, communication between the chief minister and the people so people developed a kind of security and uh, at the at that phase they recognized the crisis on one hand, one hand and 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 then the uh, role of the government so they were seeing the government in actual role of protecting people and then planning with people's consensus uh, for uh, uh, routing the end of, uh, pandemic